it possible to be an artist and to be a grown-up? Uh, why would you want to be a grown-up? There's always that thing with clowns. You go, oh, there's a sad face and a happy face. Wherever he was, it always seemed as if he wanted to be two steps further forward. why he never finished his utopia film. I really think that we almost ate Peter, the whole documentary community. We really did. Well, like, are we on a wild goose chase or what? Yeah. What is it? Oh, no, look at the size of that thing. you see me now? Yeah. you see me now? Yeah. Good, don't press the red button again. Can you talk a little bit about your source of inspiration for this film? Uh, where the idea come from? So before my dad died, he started talking about wanting to make a final film about his life. And um, he just died very quickly before we were able to start working on it. But I knew he had these um, boxes and boxes of tapes of Utopia footage that he had been filming for 15 years or so, traveling around the world exploring different ideas about utopia and what different societies imagine as a as a perfect or ideal world. So I dug up those tapes that no one had ever seen. I don't think he'd ever even watched them after he filmed them and decided to use that material as a way to create a portrait of, of him and his life and of our relationship as well as about utopia. How did you develop uh, the plot of the film? Um, well, at first... You know, I was trying to kind of make his utopia film and finish the film that he would have made. And eventually it became clear that I had to make a much more personal film and that the more interesting film would be the film that that only I could make, which was a, kind of about our relationship and not just the broader topic of utopia, which kind of anybody could explore that topic. So trying to make it a bit more personal to me and my dad and... Um, I mean, it took a long time to kind of figure out how to interweave the utopia story, like his quest for utopia as one storyline, and then my quest to understand him as another storyline, and kind of having those two two stories interweave and intertwine in the right way. So it was kind of a long process of trial and error, and just sitting with the footage, and sitting also with my feelings of grief, and trying to explore how the the grief and the story connected and and that's what ended up driving driving the plot of the film uh, as you mentioned the film is about the search of your father to find and represent youtube at least uh, it was the origin of the original point uh, what do you think it was the origin of this desire to find a utopia for your father well i think he was really someone who was struck by or moved by the different injustices in the world and seeing people living in difficult situations and um, he was someone who just saw that as completely unnecessary um, you know he he felt that we had the power to make things better if we could only just use our imagination if we can imagine things to be better then why can't we actually work towards making that a reality so um, I think that was the, the his inspiration, just seeing as he was making his films, he would, you know, travel to the Philippines or China or different places and, and meet characters and people who are just living, uh, struggling for the right to make a living and to to live a happy life. So I think it was meeting those people and wanting to shine a light on their stories that made him want to fight for a utopia in the real world. What kind of research document you have used to create a story? Uh, was there anything that left out that now you think was essential? Um, well, I mean, there was 300 tapes, uh, so many, many hours of footage. And my dad went to all kinds of different utopias or social societies that are trying to be a bit more utopian. So eco-villages or, uh, you know, squatters' communes or any kinds or historic utopias as well. And I couldn't include them all, of course. Um, but, I mean, there was one that I kind of wanted to include that I never found a spot for. And it's a historic kind of utopia called New Lanark. And it's one of his first... It was actually where the, the, the world's first, like, cooperative store, or at least in the Western world, um, that there was a factory, a cotton mill factory, where workers only had to work 
10 hours a day instead of at the time 16 hours a day in the industrial revolution and children were sent to school instead of to work in their factories which was very utopian at the time now that seems completely normal um but i think it was just an interesting example of something where even though that specific utopian bubble or factory village uh no longer exists it's kind of why we have like the eight hour work day now. Like th those were the roots of why we have these things that we take for granted now, like that we should, that children shouldn't work in factories and that, you know, we should only work, be forced to work like or eight hours a day. Or So it's just kind of a historic example of a utopia that maybe has failed in its specific instantiation of it. But the traces of that utopia and of all kinds of other failed utopias are are things that we take for granted today and have made our world better so it's like these little steps by trying to achieve this really ideal situation you actually can make small differences in the real world uh you try to make yourself familiar with the topic by studying on utopia in what ways did this process impact you as well do you feel more sympathy for utopianists right now do i feel sorry what was that last part more sympathy for you two pianists right now do i feel more uh, sympathy do you feel uh more connected to the you two pianists right now after doing this research on utopia to the idea of utopia yeah yeah i mean i think working on the film and thinking about my dad's legacy and all the work that he did through his films um made me a bit more conscious of all the small acts that we can take in our daily lives to try to uh, change the status quo and just with the, the value of working towards that. Um, he was really driven uh, to use his one life that he, that we all get this one life. And he was really driven to use it to his, the fullest of his abilities um, to help others. And I think that's one thing that allowed him to have a really, somewhat peaceful death even though it was a very scary situation and you know he wasn't ready to die at the age of 60 but he also faced his death very calmly and bravely and it's because he had he knew that he had lived you know every day um just trying to work make the world better in the, w the ways that he could and so that was really inspiring and some it was a real gift to see someone face death so calmly and to try to understand like how how does someone get to the end of their life and feel really calm well it's because they really did their best while they were here so i think that's the main lesson that i got out of it you had a famous uh, father artist how was the impact of this on your life have you ever felt that the people associated you too much with your father well i guess that was the intimidating thing about making a film about such a brilliant filmmaker it's like if your father is an architect and you're trying to make a building in honor of him like that would be really intimidating um but i mean i learned so much from him growing up just about dark documentary storytelling and i also had a lot of support from the documentary community because he was so well known and respected so i had a lot of help while making this film just people watching rough cuts and giving advice um, so in that sense, you know, it was helpful and yeah, I mean, he was, uh, a really one of a kind figure in terms of his, his approach to filmmaking and just his, his role in the, in the documentary community as well. So it's a lot to live up to. <laughs> and in making, uh, this documentary on your father, was there any specific, uh, uh, filmmaking genre or specific films that that inspired you? Yeah, um, I was really inspired by Camera Person by Kristen Johnson, which is a sort of a portrait or self-portrait of her through the work that she's done as a camera person and using outtakes um, from all of her other films that she's shot. She assembles this really beautiful uh, portrait of the person behind the camera. In that case, it's herself. And you get just a glimpse of her or, or a sense of her through what she chooses to film and through this gaze of the camera. And um, that was what I was also trying to do with my film. So as I was working on my film, eventually I saw that film and I said, OK, yes, it is possible to make a portrait of the person behind the camera. Um, because I didn't have that much footage of my dad I, in the in the Utopia tapes. Sometimes he's on camera, but often he's just behind the camera and you see his shadow or you catch glimpses of his reflection. And so I was always trying to bring out those moments and make it 
make you feel like you're just with this person seeing what he's seeing through the lens? Uh, psychologically, how was it hard to make a film about your dad? Did you discover new facts about your father that gives you a new perspective about him? Yeah, I mean, the the film making the film felt like this new conversation with him after he died where, I mean, it was a one-sided conversation. He couldn't respond, but I was finding answers or clues about him in the in the footage that he left behind and also it kind of gave me an excuse or a reason to talk to a lot of his friends and collaborators and uh, to ask them questions about him for the film but that was just really gave me a really much better understanding of him and what he was up to my cat is meowing in the background I don't know if you can hear Um, but it just like having that the framework of having to make a film about him sort of forced me to sit with him every day like in an editing room for months and months and years really Um, and that process of just reflecting on him and wondering about him and asking people questions about him did give me a better understanding of him as a person and as a as a as a father Uh, how long the process of making this film take um well it took about five and a half years I started working on it right after he died and finished it five and a half years later but within that I took you know there was two years where I just walked away from the film and didn't even look at what the material or the rough cut that I had and just took a full break because uh, I was working on other projects on the side too so it wasn't five and a half years you know complete full time but it was spread over that time. We see the funny picture of your father in the film, the fact that we didn't know much about him. Can you say a little bit about the inclusion of these scenes in the film? Yeah, I mean, my dad was a real clown. He was he was someone who could be very serious and had a brilliant mind, but he was also really funny, really playful, really witty, and um, really felt that humor was a good way to bring uh, attention to more serious issues uh, as a way to force people to kind of let down their guard have a laugh and then you kind of hit them with something more emotional or powerful or serious or important uh, while they're distracted with the laughter um, and he was just like a natural clown on camera so there's like so many moments where he's just goofing around he's pretending to be a windmill or he's just uh, playing with the camera and with with the, the world around him How did you manage to secure the fund for the film? Well, I had support from iSteel Film Productions in terms of them letting me use an editing room, um, just kind of tucked away uh, for many years without any real official funding. And then eventually then National Film Board came on board as well and helped us finish the film. And um, early on, before my dad died, he had also started raising some money for his final film. So there were some early crowdfunding supporters as well. You are also a radio editor. How does this experience impact uh, your work? Yeah, I tried to, um, in some ways, I I approached the film as a sound project. I didn't want to film anything new. I wanted to really just use the found footage, my dad's footage, um, and some of his filmography that I include in home movies, but only found footage. And then the new material where the story is kind of taking place in the film is through audio interviews that I did with his friends, telephone interviews, telephone conversations. And I really didn't want to leave the bubble of my dad's utopia footage because the footage felt so precious as to me as a connection to him as I was grieving him. And so having the audio be where the, the new material comes in and allows us to stay in the bubble of his footage while also getting these insights that his friends and collaborators are sharing with me over the phone through audio. So, so it, it did really feel in a way like a, like a sound documentary with images. Uh, we are now in the middle of a coronavirus uh, crisis. I wonder if, you, if the uh, virus or if the coronavirus had any impact on the film and its release. Yeah, it's a bit heartbreaking for everyone uh, who's releasing films right now to not get to share them on the big screen with you know surround sound and in a room full of people that you can connect with after and talk about the film and hear their experiences or their reactions to the film. Um, that's such a very special thing to really just be in a room and to um, 
be in a moment where people actually put their life on pause. They turn off their phone and they give their full attention to a film in this room and they allow the film to take them on whatever journey it's going to take them. Whereas I think, you know, the, as the festivals move online, it's it's a great way to connect with more people, people who aren't in the cities that the festival's happening in uh, can still have access to the film. You know, Hot Docs is available to all of Ontario, so you don't necessarily have to be in Toronto. Or Doxa that's coming up is available to, you know, all of BC. But there is there is something that I worry about in terms of people not necessarily giving the films their full attention if they're watching, like, on their laptops or they're still checking their phones or, you know, it's not quite the same experience. And, and mostly it's just the... It's it's hard to not be able to connect with those people who watch it. And, you know, some people might email you or message you and uh, or some other festivals are organizing virtual Q&As, which is a great way to connect. Um, but it's yeah, it's a bit disappointing to not get to just actually meet and interact with the people that uh, that come to see the film, especially in this the case of this film, because I was traveling to festivals to and meeting so many of my dad's friends around the world filmmakers that he worked with in all kinds of countries at these different festivals so that's a bit heartbreaking to not get, not get to meet them and hear more stories about my dad and uh, any final thought uh, uh, is there anything that you want to share with our readers uh, about the film well um yeah i mean i hope people can check it out at hot docs we're doing a q a at hot docs and another one at doxa so i hope people watch the film and come join the q a to have a conversation about it um and i guess otherwise it's a very personal film it's personal for me it's personal for people who knew my dad when they watch it but i also i tried to leave a lot of space in the film and a lot of breathing room uh, for people to have their own personal experiences with it and their own reflections as they're watching. So I hope that people, uh, yeah, enjoy it on whatever level resonates with them.